Question 19 of Summa Theologica Pars Prima Secundae on the last end and on human acts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Clancy, Los Angeles, California. Summa Theologica Pars Prima Secundae on the last end and on human acts by saint thomas aquinas translated by the fathers of the english dominican province question nineteen the goodness and malice of the interior act of the will in ten articles we must now consider the goodness of the interior act of the will under which head there are ten points of inquiry one whether the goodness of the will depends on the object two whether it depends on the object alone three whether it depends on reason four whether it depends on the eternal law five whether erring reason binds six whether the will is evil if it follows the erring reason against the law of god seven whether the goodness of the will in regard to the means depends on the intention of the end Eight, whether the degree of goodness or malice in the will depends on the degree of good or evil in the intention nine whether the goodness of the will depends on its conformity to the divine will ten whether it is necessary for the human will in order to be good to be conformed to the divine will as regards the thing willed first article one to two Question 19. Article 1. Whether the goodness of the will depends on the object. Objection 1. It would seem that the goodness of the will does not depend on the object. For the will cannot be directed otherwise than to what is good, since evil is outside the scope of the will, as Dionysus says, Divine Names 4. If therefore the goodness of the will depended on the object it would follow that every act of the will is good and none bad objection to further good is first of all in the end wherefore the goodness of the end as such does not depend on any other but according to the philosopher ethics six five goodness of action is the end but goodness of making is never the end because the latter is always ordained to the thing made as to its end. Therefore, the goodness of the act of the will does not depend on any object. Objection 3. Further, such as a thing is, such does it make a thing to be. But the object of the will is good, by reason of the goodness of nature. Therefore, it cannot give moral goodness to the will. Therefore, the moral goodness of the will does not depend on the object. On the contrary, the philosopher says, Ethics 5, 1, that justice is that habit from which men wish for just things, and accordingly, virtue is a habit from which men wish for good things. But a good will is one which is in accordance with virtue. Therefore, the goodness of the will is from the fact that a man wills that which is good. I answer that. Good and evil are essential differences of the act of the will. Because good and evil of themselves regard the will, just as truth and falsehood regard reason, the act of which is divided essentially by the difference of truth and falsehood. For as much as an opinion is said to be true or false, consequently good and evil will are acts differing in species now the specific difference in acts and according to objects as stated above question eighteen article five therefore good and evil in the acts of the will is derived properly from the objects reply objection one the will is not always directed to what is truly good but sometimes to the apparent good which has indeed some measure of good, but not of a good that is simply suitable to be desired. Hence, it is that 
the act of the will is not always good, but sometimes evil. Reply Objection 2. Although an action can, in a certain way, be man's last end, nevertheless, such action is not an act of the will, as stated above. Question 1, Article 1, 2, 2. Reply Objection 3. Good is presented to the will as its object by the reason, and in so far as it is in accord with reason, it enters the moral order, and causes moral goodness in the act of the will. Because the reason is the principle of human and moral acts, as stated above. Question 18, Article 5. Second Article, 1-2, to two, Question 19, Article 2. Whether the goodness of the will depends on the object alone. Objection 1. It would seem that the goodness of the will does not depend on the object alone, for the end has a closer relationship to the will than to any other power. But the acts of the other powers derive goodness not only from the object, but also from the end, as we have shown above. Question 18, Article 4. Therefore, the act also of the will derives goodness not only from the object, but also from the end. Objection 2. Further, the goodness of an action is derived not only from the object, but also from the circumstances, as stated above. Question 18. Article 3. But according to the diversity of circumstances, there may be diversity of goodness and malice in the act of the will. For instance, if a man will, when he ought, where he ought, as much as he ought, and how he ought, or if he will as he ought not, therefore the goodness of the will depends not only on the object, but also on the circumstances. Objection 3. Further ignorance of circumstances excuses malice of the will. As stated above, question 6, article 8. But it would not be so unless the goodness or malice of the will depended on the circumstances. Therefore, the goodness and malice of the will depend on the circumstances, and not only on the object. On the contrary, an action does not take its species from the circumstances as such, as stated above, question 18, article 10, to 2. But good and evil are specific differences of the act of the will as stated above, Article 1. Therefore, the goodness and malice of the will depend not on the circumstances, but on the object alone. I answer that. In every genus, the more a thing is first, the more simple it is, and the fewer the principles of which it consists. Thus primary bodies are simple. Hence, it is to be observed that the first things in every genus are in some way simple, and consist of one principle. Now the principle of the goodness and malice of human actions is taken from the act of the will. Consequently, the goodness and malice of the act of the will depend on some one thing, while the goodness and malice of other acts may depend on several things. Now that one thing which is the principle in each genus is not something accidental to that genus, but something essential thereto, because whatever is accidental is reduced to something essential as to its principle. Therefore, the goodness of the will's act depends on that one thing alone, which of itself causes goodness in the act. And that one thing is the object, and not the circumstances, which are accidents, as it were, of the act. Reply Objection 1. The end is the object of the will, but not of the other powers. Hence, in regard to the act of the will, the goodness derived from the object does not differ from that which is derived from the end, as they differ in the acts of the other powers, except perhaps accidentally, in so far as one end depends on another, and one act of the will on another. Reply Objection 2. Given that the act of the will is fixed on some good, no circumstances can make that act bad. Consequently, when it is said that a man wills a good when he ought not, or whether he ought not, this can be understood in two ways. First, so that this circumstance is referred to the thing willed, 
and thus the act of the will is not fixed on something good since to will to do something when it ought not to be done is not to will something good secondly so that the circumstance is referred to the act of willing and thus it is impossible to will something good when one ought not to because one ought always to will what is good except perhaps accidentally in so far as a man by willing some particular good is prevented from willing at the same time another good which he ought to will at that time and then evil results not from his willing that particular good but from his not willing the other the same applies to the other circumstances reply objection three ignorance of circumstances excuses malice of the will in so far as the circumstance affects the thing willed that is to say in so far as a man ignores the circumstances of the act which he wills third article one to two question nineteen article three whether the goodness of the will depends on reason objection one it would seem that the goodness of the will does not depend on reason for what comes first does not depend on what follows but the good belongs to the will before it belongs to reason as is clear from what has been said above question nine article one therefore the goodness of the will does not depend on reason objection two further the philosopher says ethics six two that the goodness of the practical intellect is a truth that is in conformity with right desire but right desire is a good will therefore the goodness of the practical reason depends on the goodness of the will rather than conversely objection three further the mover does not depend on that which is moved but vice versa but the will moves the reason and the other powers as stated above question nine article one therefore the goodness of the will does not depend on reason on the contrary hilary says on the trinity ten it is an unruly will that persists in its desires in opposition to reason but the goodness of the will consists in not being unruly therefore the goodness of the will depends on its being subject to reason i answer that as stated above articles one and two the goodness of the will depends properly on the object now the will's object is proposed to it by reason because the good understood is the proportionate object of the will while sensitive or imaginary good is proportionate not to the will but to the sensitive appetite since the will can tend to the universal good which reason apprehends whereas the sensitive appetite tends only to the particular good apprehended by the sensitive power therefore the goodness of the will depends on reason in the same way as it depends on the object reply objection one the good considered as such i e as appetitable pertains to the will before pertaining to the reason but considered as true it pertains to the reason before under the aspect of goodness pertaining to the will because the will cannot desire a good that is not previously apprehended by reason reply objection to the philosopher speaks here of the practical intellect in so far as it counsels and reasons about the means for in this respect it is perfected by prudence now we regard to the means the rectitude of the reason depends on its conformity with the desire of a due end nevertheless the very desire of the due end presupposes on the part of reason a right apprehension of the end reply objection three the will moves the reason in one way the reason moves the will in another viz on the part of the object as stated above question nine article one fourth article one to two question nineteen article four whether the goodness of the will depends on the eternal law objection one it would seem that the goodness of the human will does not depend on the eternal law because to one thing there is one rule and one measure but the rule of the human will on which its goodness depends is right reason 
Therefore the goodness of the will does not depend on the eternal law. Objection 2. Further, a measure is homogeneous with the thing measured. Metaphysics 10. 1. But the eternal law is not homogeneous with the human will. Therefore, the eternal law cannot be the measure on which the goodness of the human will depends. Objection 3. Further, a measure should be most certain, but the eternal law is unknown to us. Therefore, it cannot be the measure on which the goodness of our will depends. On the contrary, Augustine says, against Faustus and Manichae, 22, 27, that sin is a deed, word or desire against the eternal law, but malice of the will is the root of sin. Therefore, since malice is contrary to goodness, the goodness of the will depends on the eternal law. I answer that. Wherever a number of causes are subordinate to one another, the effect depends more on the first than on the second cause, since the second cause acts only in virtue of the first. Now it is from the eternal law, which is the divine reason, that human reason is the rule of the human will, from which the human derives its goodness. Hence it is written, Psalms 4, 6, 7. Many say, Who showeth us good things? The light of thy countenance, O Lord, is signed upon us. As though to say, the light of our reason is able to show us good things and guide our will, in so far as it is the light. Example derived from thy countenance. It is therefore evident that the goodness of the human will depends on the eternal law much more than on human reason. And when human reason fails, we must have recourse to the eternal reason. Reply Objection 1. To one thing there are not several proximate measures, but there can be several measures if one is subordinate to the other. Reply Objection 2. A proximate measure is homogeneous with the thing measured. A remote measure is not. Reply Objection 3. Although the eternal law is unknown to us according as it is in the divine mind, nevertheless it becomes known to us somewhat, either by natural reason, which is derived therefrom as its proper image, or by some sort of additional revelation. 5th Article 1-2, to two, Question 19, Article 5 Whether the will is evil when it is at variance with erring reason. Objection 1. It would seem that the will is not evil when it is at variance with erring reason, because the reason is the rule of the human will, in so far as it is derived from the eternal law, as stated above, Article 4. But erring reason is not derived from the eternal law. Therefore, erring reason is not the rule of the human will. Therefore, the will is not evil if it be at variance with erring reason. Objection 2. Further, according to Augustine, the command of a lower authority does not bind if it be contrary to the command of a higher authority. For instance, if a provincial governor commands something that is forbidden by the emperor, but erring reason sometimes proposes what is against the command of a higher power, namely, God whose power is supreme. Therefore, the decision of an erring reason does not bind. Consequently, the will is not evil if it be at variance with erring reason. Objection 3. Further, every evil will is reducible to some species of malice. But the will that is at variance with erring reason is not reducible to some species of malice. For instance, if a man's reason err in telling him to commit fornication. His will in not willing to do so cannot be reduced to any species of malice. Therefore, the will is not evil when it is at variance with erring reason. On the contrary, as stated in the first part, question 79, article 13, conscience is nothing else than the application of knowledge to some action. Now, knowledge is in the reason. Therefore, when the will is at variance with erring reason, 
it is against conscience but every such will is evil for it is written romans fourteen twenty three all that is not of faith i e all that is against conscience is sin therefore the will is evil when it is at variance with erring reason i answer that since conscience is a kind of dictate of the reason for it is an application of knowledge to action as was stated in the first part question nineteen article thirteen to inquire whether the will is evil when it is at variance with erring reason is the same as to inquire whether an erring conscience binds on this matter some distinguished three kinds of actions for some are good generically some are indifferent some are evil generically and they say that if reason or conscience tells us to do something which is good generically there is no error and in like manner if it tell us not to do something which is evil generically since it is the same reason that prescribes what is good and forbids what is evil on the other hand if a man's reason or conscience tells him that he is bound by precept to do what is evil in itself or that what is good in itself is forbidden then his reason or conscience errs in like manner if a man's reason or conscience tell him that what is indifferent in itself for instance to raise a straw from the ground is forbidden or commanded his reason or conscience errs they say therefore that reason or conscience when erring in matters of indifference either by commanding or by forbidding them binds so that the will which is at variance with that erring reason is evil and sinful but they say that when reason or conscience errs in commanding what is evil in itself or in forbidding what is good in itself what is necessary for salvation it does not bind wherefore in such cases the will which is at variance with erring reason or conscience is not evil but this is unreasonable for in matters of indifference the will that is at variance with erring reason or conscience is evil in some way on account of the object on which the goodness or malice of the will depends not indeed on account of the object according as it is in its own nature but according as it is accidentally apprehended by reason as something evil to do or to avoid and since the object of the will is that which is proposed by the reason as stated above article three from the very fact that a thing is proposed by the reason as being evil the will by tending thereto becomes evil and this is the case not only in indifferent matters but also in those that are good or evil in themselves for not only indifferent matters can receive the character of goodness or malice accidentally but also that which is good can receive the character of evil or that which is evil can receive the character of goodness on account of the reason apprehending it as such for instance to refrain from fornication is good yet the will does not tend to this good except in so far as it is proposed by the reason if therefore the erring reason propose it as an evil the will tends to it as to something evil consequently the will is evil because it wills evil not indeed that which is evil in itself but that which is evil accidentally through being apprehended as such by the reason in like manner to believe in christ is good in itself and necessary for salvation but the will does not tend thereto except inasmuch as it is proposed by the reason consequently if it be proposed by the reason as something evil the will tends to it as to something evil not as if it were evil in itself but because it is evil accidentally through the apprehension of the reason hence the philosopher says ethics seven nine that properly speaking the 
continent man is one who does not follow right reason, but accidentally he is also one who does not follow false reason. We must therefore conclude that, absolutely speaking, every will at variance with reason, whether right or erring, is always evil. Reply Objection 1 Although the judgment of an erring reason is not derived from God, yet the erring reason puts forward its judgment as being true, and consequently as being derived from God, from whom is all truth. Reply Objection 2 The saying of Augustine holds good when it is known that the inferior authority prescribes something contrary to the command of the higher authority. But if a man were to, to believe the command of the preconsul to be the command of the emperor, and scorning the command of the proconsul, he would scorn the command of the emperor. In like manner, if a man were to know that human reason was dictating something contrary to God's commandment, he would not be bound to abide by reason, but then reason would not be entirely erroneous. But when erring reason proposes something as being commanded by God, then to scorn the dictate of reason is to scorn the commandment of God. Reply Objection 3. Whenever reason apprehends something as evil, it apprehends it under some species of evil, for instance, as being something contrary to a divine precept, or as giving scandal, or for some such like reason, and then that evil is reduced to that species of malice. Sixth Article, 1-2, to two, Question 19, Article 6. Whether the will is good when it abides by erring reason. Objection 1. It would seem that the will is good when it abides by erring reason. For just as the will, when at variance with the reason, tends to that which reason judges to be evil, so when in accord with reason it tends to what reason judges to be good. But the will is evil when it is at variance with reason, even when erring. Therefore, even when it abides by erring reason, the will is good. Objection 2. Further, the will is always good when it abides by the commandment of God and the eternal law. But the eternal law and God's commandment are proposed to us by the apprehension of the reason, even when it errs. Therefore, the will is good even when it abides by erring reason. Objection 3. Further, the will is evil when it is at variance with erring reason. If, therefore, the will is evil, also when it abides by erring reason, it seems that the will is always evil when in conjunction with erring reason, so that in such a case a man would be in a dilemma, and of necessity would sin, which is unreasonable. Therefore the will is good when it abides by erring reason. On the contrary, the will of those who slew the apostles was evil, and yet it was in accord with the erring reason, according to John 16.2. The hour cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doth a service to God. Therefore the will can be evil when it abides by erring reason. I answer that. Whereas the previous question is the same as inquiring whether an erring conscience binds, so this question is the same as inquiring whether an erring conscience excuses. Now this question depends on what has been said above about ignorance. For what it was said, question 6, article 8, that ignorance sometimes causes an act to be involuntary and sometimes not. And since moral good and evil consist in action in so far as it is voluntary, as was stated above, article 2, it is evident that when ignorance causes an act to be involuntary, it takes away the character of moral good and evil, but not when it does not cause the act to be involuntary. Again, it has been stated above, question 6, article 8, that when ignorance is in any way willed, either directly or indirectly, 
it does not cause the act to be involuntary. And I call that ignorance directly voluntary, to which the act of the will tends, and that indirectly voluntary, which is due to negligence by reason of a man not wishing to know what he ought to know, as stated above, question 6, article 8. If then reason or conscience err with an error that is voluntary, either directly or through negligence, so that one errs about what one ought to know, then such an error of reason or conscience does not excuse the will. That abides by that erring reason or conscience from being evil. But if the error arise from ignorance of some circumstance and without any negligence, so that it cause the act to be involuntary, then that error of reason or conscience excuses the will that abides by that erring reason from being evil. For instance, if erring reason tell a man that he should go to another man's wife, the will that abides by that erring reason is evil, since this error arises from ignorance of the divine law, which he is bound to know. But if a man's reason errs in mistaking another for his wife, and if he wish to give her her right when she asks for it, his will is excused from being evil, because this error arises from ignorance of a circumstance, which ignorance excuses and causes the act to be involuntary. Reply Objection 1 As Dionysus says, Divine Names, 4. Good results from the entire cause evil from each particular defect. Consequently, in order that the thing to which the will tends be called evil, it suffices either that it be evil in itself or that it be apprehended as evil. But in order for it to be good, it must be good in both ways. Reply Objection 2. The eternal law cannot err, but human reason can. Consequently, the will that abides by human reason is not always right, nor is it always in accord with the eternal law. Reply Objection 3. Just as in syllogistic arguments, granted one absurdity, others must needs follow. So in moral matters, given one absurdity, others must follow too. Thus, suppose a man to seek vainglory. He will sin whether he does his duty for vainglory or whether he omit to do it. Nor is he in a dilemma about the matter, because he can put aside his evil intention. In like manner, suppose a man's reason or conscience to err through inexcusable ignorance, then evil must needs result in the will. Nor is this man in a dilemma, because he can lay aside his error, since his ignorance is vincible and voluntary. 7th Article, 1-2, to two, Question 19, Article 7. Whether the goodness of the will, as regards the means, depends on the intention of the end. Objection 1. It would seem that the goodness of the will does not depend on the intention of the end, for it has been stated above, Article 2, that the goodness of the will depends on the object alone. But as regards the means, the object of the will is one thing, and the end intended is another. Therefore, in such matters, the goodness of the will does not depend on the intention of the end. Objection to, further, to wish to keep God's commandment belongs to a good will, but this can be referred to an evil end, for instance, to vainglory or covetousness, by willing to obey God for the sake of temporal gain. Therefore, the goodness of the will does not depend on the intention of the end. Objection 3. Further, just as good and evil diversify the will, so do they diversify the end. But malice of the will does not depend on the malice of the end intended, since a man who wills to steal in order to give alms has an evil will, although he intends a good end. Therefore, neither does the goodness of the will depend on the goodness of the end intended. On the contrary, Augustine says, Confessions 9.3, that God rewards the intention, but God rewards a thing because it is good. Therefore, the goodness of the will depends on the intention of the end. I answer that. 
the intention may stand in a twofold relation to the act of the will first as preceding it secondly as following leo nine edition accompanying it the intention precedes the act of the will causally when we will something because we intend a certain end and then the order to the end is considered as the reason of the goodness of the thing willed for instance when a man wills to fast for god's sake because the act of fasting is specifically good from the very fact that it is done for god's sake wherefore since the goodness of the will depends on the goodness of the thing willed as stated above articles one and two it must of necessity depend on the intention of the end on the other hand intention follows the act of the will when it is added to a preceding act of the will for instance a man may will to do something and may afterwards refer it to god and then the goodness of the previous act of the will does not depend on the subsequent intention except in so far as that act is repeated with the subsequent intention reply objection one when the intention is the cause of the act of willing the order to the end is considered as the reason of the goodness of the object as stated above reply objection two the act of the will cannot be said to be good if an evil intention is the cause of willing for when a man wills to give an alms for the sake of vainglory he wills that which is good in itself under a species of evil and therefore as willed by him it is evil wherefore his will is evil if however the intention is subsequent to the act of the will then the latter may be good and the intention does not spoil that act of the will which preceded but that which is repeated reply objection three as we have already stated article six to one evil results from each particular defect but good from the whole and entire cause hence whether the will tend to what is evil in itself even under the species of good or to the good under the species of evil it will be evil in either case but in order for the will to be good it must tend to the good under the species of good in other words it must will the good for the sake of the good eighth article one to two question nineteen article eight whether the degree of goodness or malice in the will depends on the degree of good or evil in the intention objection one it would seem that the degree of goodness in the will depends on the degree of good in the intention because on matthew twelve thirty five a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good a gloss says a man does as much good as he intends but the intention gives goodness not only to the in external action but also to the act of the will as stated above article seven therefore the goodness of a man's will is according to the goodness of his intention objection to further if you add to the cause you add to the effect but the goodness of the intention is the cause of the good will therefore a man's will is good according as his intention is good objection three further in evil actions a man sins in proportion to his intention for if a man were to throw a stone with a murderous intention he would be guilty of murder therefore for the same reason in good actions the will is good in proportion to the good intended on the contrary the intention can be good while the will is evil therefore for the same reason the intention can be better and the will less good i answer that in regard to both the act and the intention of the end we may consider a twofold quantity one on the part of the object by reason of a man willing or doing a good that is greater the other taken from the intensity of the act according as a man wills or acts intensely and this is more on the part of the agent if then we speak of this respective quantities from the point of view of the object it is evident that the quantity in the act does not depend on the quantity in the intention with regard to the external act this may happen in two ways first through the object that is ordained 
to the intended end not being proportionate to that end. For instance, if a man were to give ten pounds, he could not realize his intention, if he intended to buy a thing worth a hundred pounds. Secondly, on account of the obstacles that may supervene in regard to the exterior action, which obstacles we are unable to remove, for instance, a man intends to go to Rome, and encounters obstacles which prevent him from going. On the other hand, with regard to the interior act of the will, this happens in only one way, because the interior acts of the will are in our power, whereas the external actions are not. But the will can will an object that is not proportionate to the intended end, and thus the will that tends to that object considered absolutely is not so good as the intention. Yet because the intention also belongs, in a way, to the act of the will, inasmuch to wit, as it is the reason thereof, it comes to pass that the quantity of goodness in the intention redounds upon the act of the will, that is to say, in so far as the will wills some great good for an end, although that by which it wills to gain so great a good is not proportionate to that good. But if we consider the quantity in the intention and in the act, according to their respective intensity, then the intensity of the intention redounds upon the interior act and the exterior act of the will. Since the intention stands in relation to them as a kind of form, as is clear from what has been said above, question 12, article 4, question 18, article 6, and yet considered materially, while the intention is intense, the interior or exterior act may not be so intense, materially speaking. For instance, when a man does not will with as much intensity to take medicine as he wills to regain health, nevertheless the very fact of intending health intensely redounds as a formal principle upon the intense volition of medicine. We must observe, however, that the intensity of the interior or exterior act may be referred to the intention as its object, as when a man intends to will intensity or to do something intensely. And yet it does not follow that he wills or acts intensely, because the quantity of goodness in the interior or exterior act does not depend on the quantity of the good intended, as is shown above, and hence it is that a man does not merit as much as he intends to merit, because the quantity of merit is measured by the intensity of the act, as we shall show later on. Question 20, Article 4, Question 114, Article 4. Reply, Objection 1. This gloss speaks of good as in the estimation of God who considers principally the intention of the end. Wherefore, another gloss says, on the same passage, that the treasure of the heart is the intention, according to which God judges our works. For the goodness of the intention, as stated above, redounds, so to speak, upon the goodness of the will, which makes even the external act to be meritous in God's sight. Reply Objection 2 the goodness of the intention is not the whole cause of a good will, hence the argument does not prove. Reply Objection 3. The mere malice of the intention suffices to make the will evil, and therefore, too, the will is as evil as the intention is evil. But the same reasoning does not apply to goodness as stated above. 2. 2. Article 9. 1-2. Question 19. Article 9 whether the goodness of the will depends on its conformity to the divine will. Objection 1. It would seem that the goodness of the human will does not depend on its conformity to the divine will, because it is impossible for man's will to be conformed to the divine will, as appears from the word of Isaiah 55, 9. As the heavens are exalted above the earth, so are my ways exalted above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. If therefore goodness of the will depended on its conformity to the divine will, it would follow that it is impossible for man's will to be good, which is inadmissible. Objection 2. Further, just as our wills arise from the divine will, so does our knowledge flow from the divine knowledge. But our knowledge does not require to be conformed to God's knowledge, since God knows many things that we know not. 
Therefore, there is no need for our will to be conformed to the divine will. Objection 3. Further, the will is a principle of action, but our action cannot be conformed to God's. Therefore, neither can our will be conformed to His. On the contrary, it is written, Matthew 26, 39, Not as I will, but as thou wilt, which words he said because he wishes man to be upright and to tend to God. As Augustine expounds in the Enchiridion, and orations in Psalm 32, Sermon 1. But the rectitude of the will is its goodness. Therefore the goodness of the will depends on its conformity to the divine will. I answer that, as stated above, Article 7. The goodness of the will depends on the intention of the end. Now the last end of the human will is the sovereign good, namely God, as stated above. Question 1, Article 8, Question 3, Article 1. Therefore, the goodness of the human will requires it to be ordained to the sovereign good, that is, to God. Now, this good is primarily and essentially compared to the divine will as its proper object. Again, that which is first in any genus is the measure and rule of all that belongs to that genus. Moreover, everything attains to rectitude and goodness in so far as it is in accord with its proper measure. Therefore, in order that man's will be good, it needs to be conformed to the divine will. Reply Objection 1. The human will cannot be conformed to the will of God so as to equal it, but only so as to imitate it. In like manner, human knowledge is conformed to the divine knowledge in so far as it knows truth, and human action is conformed to the divine in so far as it is becoming to the agent and this by way of imitation, not by way of equality. From the above may be gathered the replies to the second and third objections. Tenth article, 1 to 2, question 19, article 10. Whether it is necessary for the human will, in order to be good, to be conformed to the divine will, as regards the thing willed. Objection 1. It would seem that the human will need not always be conformed to the divine will as regards the thing willed. For we cannot will what we know not, since the apprehended good is the object of the will. But in many things we know not what God wills. Therefore the human will cannot be conformed to the divine will as to the thing willed. Objection 2. Further. God wills to damn the man whom he foresees about to die in mortal sin. If, therefore, man were bound to conform his will to the divine will, in the point of the thing willed, it would follow that a man is bound to will his own damnation, which is inadmissible. Objection 3. Further, no one is bound to will what is against filial piety, but if man were to will what God wills, this would sometimes be contrary to filial piety. For instance, when God wills the death of a father, if his son were to will it also, it would be against filial piety. Therefore man is not bound to conform his will to the divine will, as to the thing willed. On the contrary, 1. On Psalms 32, 1. Praise becometh the upright. A gloss says that man has an upright heart who wills what God wills, but everyone is bound to have an upright heart. Therefore, everyone is bound to will what God wills. 2. Moreover, the will takes its form from the object, as does every act. If therefore man is bound to conform his will to the divine will, it follows that he is bound to conform it as to the thing willed. 3. Moreover, opposition of wills arises from men willing different things. But whoever has a will in opposition to the divine will has an evil will. Therefore, whoever does not conform his will to the divine will, as to the thing willed, has an evil will. I answer that. As is evident from what has been said above, Articles 3 and 5, the will tends to its object according to as it is proposed by the reason. Now a thing may be considered in various ways by the reason, so as to appear good from one point of view, and not good from another point of view. 
and therefore if a man's will wills a thing to be according as it appears to be good his will is good and the will of another man who wills that thing not to be according as it appears evil is also good thus a judge has a good will in willing a thief to be put to death because this is just while the will of another e g the thief's wife or son who wishes him not to be put to death inasmuch as killing is a natural evil is also good now since the will follows the apprehension of the reason or intellect the more universal the aspect of the apprehended good the more universal the good to which the will tends this is evident in the example given above because the judge has care of the common good which is justice and therefore he wishes the thief's death which has the aspect of good in relation to the common estate whereas the thief's wife has to consider the private good of the family and from this point of view she wishes her husband the thief not to be put to death now the good of the whole universe is that which is apprehended by god who is the maker and governor of all things hence whatever he wills he wills it under the aspect of the common good this is his own goodness which is the good of the whole universe on the other hand the apprehension of a creature according to its nature is of some particular good proportionate to that nature now a thing may happen to be good under a particular aspect and yet not good under a universal aspect or vice versa as stated above and therefore it comes to pass that a certain will is good from willing something considered under a particular aspect which thing god wills not under a universal aspect and vice versa and hence too it is that various wills of various men can be good in respect of opposite things for as much as under various aspects they wish a particular thing to be or not to be but a man's will is not right in willing a particular good unless he refer it to the common good as an end since even the natural appetite of each part is ordained to the common good of the whole now it is the end that supplies the formal reason as it were of willing whatever is directed to the end consequently in order that a man will some particular good with a right will he must will that particular good materially the divine and universal good formally therefore the human will is bound to be conformed to the divine will as to that which is willed formally for it is bound to will the divine and universal good but not as to that which is willed materially for the reason given above at the same time in both these respects the human will is conformed to the divine in a certain degree because inasmuch as it is conformed to the divine will in the common aspect of the thing willed it is conformed thereto in the point of the last end while inasmuch as it is not conformed to the divine will in the thing willed materially it is conformed to that will considered as efficient cause since the proper inclination consequent to nature or to the particular apprehension of some particular thing comes to a thing from god as its efficient cause hence it is customary to say that a man's will in this respect is conformed to the divine will because it wills what god wishes him to will there is yet another kind of conformity in respect of the formal cause consisting in man's willing something from charity as god wills it and this conformity is also reduced to the formal conformity that is in respect of the last end which is the proper object of charity reply objection one we can know in a general way what god wills for we know that whatever god wills he wills it under the aspect of good consequently whoever wills a thing under any aspect of good has a will conformed to the divine will as to the reason of the thing willed but we know not what god wills in particular and in this respect we are not bound to conform our will to the divine will but in the state of glory every one will see in each thing that he wills 
the relation of that thing to what God wills in that particular matter. Consequently, he will conform his will to God in all things, not only formally, but also materially. Reply Objection 2 God does not will the damnation of a man, considered precisely as damnation, nor a man's death, considered precisely as death, because he wills all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4 But he wills such things under the aspect of justice. Wherefore, in regard to such things, it suffices for men to will the upholding of God's justice and of the natural order. Wherefore, the reply to the third objection is evident. To the first argument advanced in a contrary sense, it should be said that a man who conforms his will to God's in the aspect of reason of the thing willed wills what God wills more than the man who conforms his will to God's in the point of the very thing willed because the will tends more to the end than to that which is on account of the end. To the second it must be replied that the species and form of an act are taken from the object considered formally rather than from the object considered materially. To the third it must be said that there is no opposition of wills when several people desire different things but not under the same aspect but there is opposition of wills when under one and the same aspect one man wills a thing which another wills not but there is no question of this here end of question nineteen